I'm going to go ahead and get started so that I can pass it off to Jennifer in just a minute. Um, good evening, everyone. My name is Albany. I work for the city of Sunnyvale, and I'm so excited that all of you chose to join us this evening for our final Bosco workshop of the spring season. Um, so along with our co-sponsor tonight and our instructor, Jennifer, I just want to say thank you all. So before we begin tonight's program, I'm just going to go over some housekeeping rules. Um, first of all, all attendees will be defaulted, default muted um, in order to reduce background noise. And if we could go to the next slide, please, Jennifer. Perfect, thank you. So everyone will be muted. Um, however, we will be taking questions throughout the presentation and at the end. So you can ask questions in two ways. You can either use the Q&A function. Um, please do not put any questions in the chat because we will not be taking questions from there. So please put questions either in the Q&A box or um, at the end of the presentation, I'll offer for everyone to raise their hands if they'd like to ask a brief question to Jennifer directly. And then um, if you forget anything or whatnot, no worries, this webinar will be recorded and it will be up on the Bosco website in a couple weeks. So a little bit about Bosca, our partner agency. Bosca is a special district that represents the interests of 26 cities, water districts, and private water companies, all of which purchase water wholesale from the SF San Francisco Regional Water System. Um, Bosca member agencies collectively serve over 1.8 million residents and 40,000 businesses in San Mateo, Santa Clara, and Alameda counties. And the goal of Bosca is to ensure a reliable supply of high quality water at a fair price for our agencies and their customers. So the program objectives of um, these workshops, um, overall we wanna teach residents that outdoor water use represents the single largest untapped opportunity for water conservation in the Bosca service area. And second, outdoor water use reduction through the use of water efficient plants and innovative techniques, such as those that we'll be going over tonight can help conserve water and ensure that future water supply needs of our communities are met. So I'm just gonna share a couple quick rebates with you, both from Bosca and from the city of Sunnyvale. Um, first off, there's the Lawn Be Gone rebate, which gives residents various rebates um, for transforming their lawns and making them more water efficient. You can earn one to $4 per square foot of lawn replaced. And then second, um, there's a rain barrel rebate program, and we've had some rainwater harvesting classes in the past, if you'd like to check out the recordings. Um, but you can earn up to $200 for purchasing a rain barrel to use in your garden. Um, next, um, in Sunnyvale, um, with Bosco, we have a new smart controller rebate and installation program. So this is a smart sprinkler program. So if that's something you're interested in, um, there's a page on Bosco's website for it. It's called The Ratio. And then there's also a new rain garden rebate program. Um, and all rain garden projects that meet minimum require requirements for this program will be rebated $300. So that's a nice one as well. And then um, if you're interested in tonight's class or you're looking for any other classes, check out this list of classes that other cities in the area will be hosting. Um, in the coming weeks, we'll be talking about um, previous pervious pavement and design it yourself native plant landscaping. And then if you need any tips about um, gardening materials, plants and whatnot, you can not only find resources on the Bosco website, but also check out bayareagardening.org for a lot of ideas. And then two additional rebates that we have active in Sunnyvale right now. There's the landscape rebate, rebate program, which offers rebates for replacing lawns and plants that require a lot of water with drought tolerant plants or permeable hardscape. And you can earn up to $1 per square foot for this rebate. And then we also have the iHeart Gray Water Program, which gives residents up to $200 in rebates for connecting their washing machine to a gray water irrigation program. And then also I just wanna mention our smart station really quick. If you need any composting um, for your gardening needs, you can come to the smart station in Sunnyvale. And this is also um, open to um, members of neighboring cities like Mountain View and Palo Alto. You can come to the smart station and you can pick up 
up to 96 gallons of compost per week as long as you bring your own container. So that is a great resource as well for our spring gardening. Oh, I think we did this one already. Perfect. All right, so with that, I'm gonna hand it off to Jennifer for our presentation. Great, thank you. Um, wow, those are some great programs, especially the compost one. I would totally take advantage of that. Um, anyway, hi everybody, thanks for joining and thanks for having me. Uh, my name is Jennifer and I have a succulent business um, called Westwind Succulents. I do a lot of weddings and events and crafting with succulent classes where we make wreaths. I grow a lot of the succulents that I use for that myself in Lafayette. And um, I now even have a storefront in Oakland on College Avenue, where now I have houseplants and a bunch of other goodies and local artists who make plant related fun things. So that's me. Um, and so let's get talking about gardening with succulents. Um, Let's talk a little bit about what makes a succulent a succulent. Um, they're defined only by the water stored in their leaves. Um, they have a tremendous variety of colors, textures, growth habits, and forms. Um, their ease of propagation, drought tolerance, and low maintenance requirements make these plants the perfect choice for practically everybody. Um, the great thing about them is that they want to live. They naturally grow in incredibly unforgiving climates, so they have found ways to ensure their survival. They are very forgiving and I think they're the perfect plant for the beginner gardener. Um, that's how I fell in love with them is I started propagating them and realized how easy it was. So I'll get into propagating tips as well. Um, but first I thought it would be good to talk about um, designing tips first because I feel like that is like a nice jumping off point um, to think about. And um, it's very, I went to art school also. So I actually majored in painting and sculpture. So I feel like I kind of approach everything from that standpoint. And since, you know, when you're creating um, a garden, it is a very visual thing. So I think that's important to talk about some, some basic elements. So um, things that I think about are a good variation of color, texture, sizes, and shapes. Um, these elements should create good movement. I don't know if you've um, taken any art classes, but if you've taught people, hear people talk about movement, it's like the placement of objects and how it makes your eye move through the space. So for a garden, it would be how your plants flow, how um, your eye or even you move through the space physically, right? So like pathways and things like that are going to all affect um, what you choose to do. Oops. Oops, oops. Okay, so first let's talk about color. I think that's a great, uh, very important thing. And luckily with succulents, there's so many colors, so it's fun to play with. Um, I like this example garden because although it's a pretty restrictive color pa palette, it's really powerful because of that. Right, like there's very, um, there's like a very specific vision here and um, it's kind of strict, which I think can be really effective rather than like having a, like too many colors and things getting lost. I feel like all of these plants um, sh show themselves well because of that. So uh, something I think about are sometimes our bridge colors. So that's like a connecting color. Um, if you're not really sure what to do, you could think about um, what ties two very different colors together. So um, in my opinion, this um, kind of like very yellow and very blue color are like very, they're very different, but as soon as you throw in some more rusty colors, that, that kind of bridges that color gap, if that makes sense. It softens that and um, makes them all more harmonious. So let's also talk about textures and shapes. So I really like this garden too because the soft, tiny sedum um, in contrast with these big, sharp agaves are, uh, are a good balance. So I try to have lots of different, uh, gosh, is that gonna pop up? Um, <laughs> 
I try to have different textures so that again with the color the more differences you have the more things show themselves if that makes sense if that makes sense um i have put together things that are too similar of a texture and it all kind of gets lost and kind of looks like one big mush if, if that makes sense and you don't really get to see each thing for its own beauty so i try to break things up separate textures separate shapes so that they're more visible. Um, so movement and grouping. This is another thing to think about. Um, so you're going to think about where you actually plant your, your items. So I love, love, love this example here because although there's not a ton of plants, they're very specifically placed. Um, to me, it looks random, which I think is really good. I think that when things are placed more randomly, they look more natural. Um, you may notice when you start looking at other gardens, sometimes you'll see gardens that are very regimented and there's a lot of things all in a row and things are like shaped harshly. Um, I feel like that's just my opinion is that I feel like that looks a little um, unnatural which you might, you might um, um, enjoy that and that's your style and that's totally fine too. But I feel like if you're going, if you wanna go for a natural organic looking garden, something that kind of looks like it just grew there by itself, right? Which I think is what a lot of people want, then that's something to take into consideration. So another way that that has happened in this garden is there's these big, um, I don't know if that's, I don't know why this is happening. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, anyway, sorry about that. Um, so another great thing to do is use these rocks um, as top dressings. You can use small pebbles and that will kind of create a movement as well. I'm sorry, I'm getting really distracted. Albany, can you see, is my text thing popping up for everyone? <laughs> no, it's not. All we see is your presentation and your mouse. Okay, thank you. I'm so sorry, everybody. I was like trying no, to you're frame, fine. turn something no off. And I'm like super distracted. Okay, so I'll be a little more focused out because that was uh, weird. Okay, so um, you can use things like gravel and colored rocks on the top here and see how this really nicely finishes this negative space that's showing with these succulents. So there's a nice natural color here and it almost looks as if that could be a ground cover, but it's not, right? So you're not using a ton of plants, but you're getting a nice finished effect. Um, here's another example of a really important thing, especially if you have limited space, is size and height of your plants really, really matters. So this obviously is an insanely gorgeous arrangement. And although there's a ton of plants, you can see how they are different sizes, right? You have this nice tall euphorbia, you have these big round agaves, and then you have this nice swath of sand and rock here. So this, see how this really breaks up the space and you can your eye can really move around and enjoy each individual plant on its own, right? Because you have a nice variety of that size and height and color and texture, right? It's all like nicely balanced. Um, now here on the right is an even more important use of um, height, which this is a very shallow garden. So you have this tall fence that kind of becomes your backdrop. So it, this may be obvious to some, but it's, it's important to have these tall things in the back um, so that nothing gets lost, right? It would be a shame if you planted something in the back and then you have a big tall thing grow in front of it, you're not gonna see it ever. Um, also, I think it's a really good idea to do nice tall stuff toward the back because then it covers your fence nicely. This is a beautiful fence, but you wanna see the plants, right? So it almost makes these plants pop more because you have that nice, beautiful, dark background and these tall, cool cacti really show. So think of your canvas, think of what's gonna be seen behind things. So that might be your house wall, the color of your house. 
um, trees, things like that. So just kind of take everything in your yard into consideration. Um, and here's a little thing I throw in because I'm like, oh, I feel like I should throw in some, some questionable design just so you can kind of compare, right? It's easy to just show a bunch of um, beautiful yards, but these are things that I might question if they're successful. So for here we have um, a big chunk of aeonium and another big chunk of variegated aeonium divided by this stripe situation of an agave. Um, while clustering, I think, is great sometimes, I feel like this is just, it's too stripey. Like it's just, I'm very distracted by the stripiness rather than the beautiful plants. So I would break this up, take some of those out, cut back the aeonium, add a few other nice big elements like different colors and different shapes. And then here I feel like is not such a great use of the top dressing rocks. It's very stripy, it's very distracting. Um, it doesn't look natural, right? Um, all I see when I look at this, instead of the beautiful seconds, I see the rocks. And then on this slide, you'll see some rocks. And I would say that my criticism would be that these rocks seem a little bit too large in scale and compared to the succulents. And they're kind of like clustered up there. And again, it just doesn't feel very natural and the big roundness of these rocks against, they're too similar of a shape, of a size and shape to the succulents, right? So I would go with something much finer like these little guys here, I think would be a much better choice and just get rid of those. Um, okay, and then another thing to talk, and I realize I'm going fast too, so we'll have lots of time um, after, I'll, I'll pause after the landscaping before we start talking about the propagation and care of them. So if anyone has any like artistic or design questions, they can definitely let me know. Um, but another thing to think about is you don't have to do just succulents, right? You can have what I call companion plants. Um, a really great thing to consider, especially for a little bit of shade, would be some trees, drought tolerant trees. There are so many different kinds. Um, this here is an acacia. Um, it's evergreen. There's evergreen types and deciduous types. Um, this is a Circidium hybrid called Desert Museum. It's one of my mom's favorite trees. Um, and it's semi -ever evergreen depending on the climate that it's in. Um, and then eucalyptus, I love, there's so many different kinds, so, so many, and they're not all huge and gigantic. There's some that are dwarf, which means that they stay smaller. And there's so many different leaf varieties. And I think that the color of eucalyptus tend to be really great companion for succulents because so many succulents have that kind of powdery blue color as well. So it kind of mimics that and ties in well because of that. Um, grasses are probably like my number one favorite thing to mix with succulents, um, mainly because A, well, there's a lot of really drought tolerant ones, and B, they, um, they have such different texture. They're so fine and like kind of furry and hairy feeling, and there's not a lot of succulents that feel like that, so I think it's a nice combo to mix in. You kind of see that here, there's a, there's a, grass right in there and back in here. Um, another thing is protea, they're incredible. And there's a lot of different types of those as well. Um, this is a picture from the Ruth Bancroft Garden in Walnut Creek. And if anyone um, hasn't been there, they should go. It, especially right now, there's a lot of things blooming. Um, I'll, put a, I'll put a note about that later in the slides too. But this is a great, great plant. It's so bright. Again, that, that color is amazing. The only thing to keep in mind if you want to use these is they don't tolerate phosphorus soil. So certain soils that have fertilizers and stuff, they're not going to want. Um, there's a lot of different shrubs like this Arctostopolis is not uh, a super, super huge one. So just taking into consideration how big things get. I think grasses is a great thing too. I've had a lot of people ask me about like lawn replacements. And again, talking about how, if you don't want to fill your whole yard with succulents, grasses are a great way to fill in space, especially grasses that say shorter, um, like drought tolerant grasses versus a lawn, obviously, that can act as more of a ground cover and give you a nice big swath of color. And then you can fill in really cool 
succulents around that. So there are other, other things to consider when you're doing your design. Um, a good thing to do is create focal points. So vignettes, moments, I would call them. So this uh, fountain does a really good job at becoming the yard's focal point. And then all the plants kind of move around it well, right? So your eye starts there and kind of travels all around through the path and with the different colors and heights. So I think this is really successful. Um, and use rocks like we've talked about. Um, they also will make your succulents happier. Succulents naturally grow in and around rocks, so it'll make them feel right at home. Um, another thing to think about is your front yard versus your backyard. Um, just kind of what activities you're going to be doing. A lot of times people tend to make their front yard a little bit more formal and um, you know, more show stoppy, if you will, because it's like the front of their house that's the first thing they want to see when they get home. Whereas the backyard is ten tends to be a little bit more functional and where you hang out and spend time. So you might have a different setup there, right? So, and then on that note too, um, be safe with spikes, I always say. Um, I have had so many close calls with agaves and cacti with huge spines and some even bad ones where I like, was come I moved a cactus in my nursery to a place that it didn't used to be and I came running around the corner with something holding something and I kicked it with my like knee my knee right into the spines and it, it was very painful for like a week um but anyway especially if you have like kids or dogs and stuff like that just that's something to think about probably just move things so that they're not I mean spiky things are great don't get me wrong I don't want to shy anyone away from them but just consider where you're putting them don't put them near like a hose bib or near a high traffic area right by your front door or something like that um oh another thing i was going to say about your house in particular uh, especially back at that slide with the very modern house take into consideration maybe the style your house is and that will dictate how like how you want to make your yard feel right how formal how um, more natural, or you might want to do it more um, things in a row, things in a line if your house is more modern, you know, it's, it's totally up to you. But I think the style of your house might be a nice thing to take into consideration, along with the color, along with, you know, the size and things like that. Um, the last thing too to consider is removing things that aren't working. Um, things that like visually clutter your eye. Sometimes it's better to start with a blank slate. Um, I'm not saying you should rip out all your existing everything because that's bad and wasteful too. But you know, if there's just like an area and there's a tree that you're working around or a shrub you're working around and it's just really not working, it's okay to take out, you know, things here and there if they're just not really um, melding with your vision. <laughs> Um, another good thing that's good for drainage as well as visual interest is mounding. This is not the most amazing photo, but this was um, the before photo of a, gar a little like, strip of garden I did where we started with a nice big mount. She just had this very thin strip right here. Of, it was just flat against this big uh, cinder block retaining wall. And so we just went ahead and made big old mounds that kind of cascaded down so that it was a little bit more visually interesting as well as um, creating good drainage for all of these succulents. Um, so that's something else to consider is your soil. Your soil needs to be really well draining for succulents. They do not want to be sitting in soppy mushy water. So uh, this is a little example of a way you can kind of test how well your drainage is. You can um, dig a hole and just kind of see how fast it drains. Now this is a fancy way where if you really wanted to like see the exact speed you could take a um, tape measure and like a timer and see how fast it drains per you know how many inches per um, minute or so it drains. I think the key thing is just if you fill a hole you want to visually start seeing it drain, right? You don't want it to just be like sitting and sitting and sitting. That's bad, a bad sign. And so all you really need to do if that is the case, then just mix in some lava rock or some pumice. I think lava rock is the best thing to use in ground, um, mainly because it looks better because it's red. So it kind of blends with the soil better. 
um, versus the pumice, it's fine and great, but it's a little, it'll give you a little more of a speckly effect, which again, if you're using a top dressing of decorative rocks or mulch, it's not really a big deal. You don't have to worry about it. But really the only difference is, is that the pumice actually has more nutrients in it. So it's better in pots because pots lose their nutrients faster versus um, in ground. You, you're gonna have a lot of natural uh, biodiversity, biodiversity, your, um, your, what is it? Your native soil, your natural, your, the soil in your ground is probably great and full of good stuff. As long as it has good drainage, then that's like the most important thing to really worry about. You can also mix in sand, um, things like that. Uh, I just threw in this example, just so you know what it is. Perlite is something that you often see, especially in when you go and buy a plant from a nursery or like a house plant. A lot of times big greenhouse grower producers will use perlite in the soil. It's not that great. There's no um, nutrients in it. It's, it's basically superheated popped uh, pumice. So it's kind of, it's like, it's like pumice popcorn. <laughs> There's nothing really in it. Um, it's good for propagating. That's what I use for propagating, but I don't really put it in ground or anything I'm planting long-term. Like that's like a big healthy plant. Just kind of don't use it. Um, another thing you can, people often ask me like how they actually amend the soil. If you were doing like a whole big section of ground that's not well draining, you might consider like renting or uh, borrowing a rototiller, really mixing it all in really well. Or if you're just putting in a few succulents here and there, you can just kind of like dig in the hole that you're, a uh, mix in the hole that you're placing in the succulent. Also, if you're doing a cactus, I recommend really making sure, like digging a nice big hole, like double the size of the root ball and doing that in like extra gravelly, extra lava rocky, just to make sure at least until that guy gets really established and happy there that he's not going to rot upon first water and, and his new his new life there. You wanna make sure he gets a nice strong fighting chance with well-training soil. Um, so I guess now we're kind of like moving into care. So, but I guess before I continue on and get into propagation, does anyone have any questions based on what I've talked about so far? Uh, we do not have any questions in the Q&A, so if anyone has questions on what Jennifer has said so far, please drop them in um, and we can get to them now or at the end. Okay. But for now, um, you can keep going, Jennifer. Okay, great. Okay, so let's talk about watering. Um, a lot of people think that you don't need to water succulents. Um, this is a very general general rule of thumb because every, every climate is totally different. Um, like like Oakland where I am versus like San Jose or somewhere that gets a lot hotter for more days in a row, you're going to water differently than I do, right? So, and also everybody's ground is different. Everybody's sun exposure is different. So these are all things that are going to affect how often you water. But something to just think about, like I was saying with the cactus getting established, that's a term that just means a, a plant kind of getting used to where it's being. It's gonna, it, getting mature, getting, um, you know, after like, it can, that can be a year, it could be a few months, but usually when people say water frequently until it's established, that kind of means thing, things that are drought, drought tolerant aren't necessarily drought tolerant until it really gets happy where it is. And then you can water it less. Right, but it, you, I kind of think of them as like babies. So the first like couple years, they're kind of like little babies. They're getting used to where their new home, and then you can kind of back off um, watering until you're sure that they're nice. They have a big, nice, strong root system. That's what you're wanting. Um, but a general rule of thumb in like super super hot months is water every one to two weeks. Um, in pots, you're gonna always always water until you see water running out a drainage hole because that way you know all of those roots in that pot are all getting water, not just the top. I've, I've done that. I've been in a hurry in my nursery and I'm just kind of going through and then I've gone and taken stuff out of their pots and only the top inch has gotten water. And it's like, oh God, I'm sorry. So um, just make sure you do a real good soak and then you wait. That's the key. When you water, water really well and deeply and then you wait until the soil gets dry. 
So it's, it's infrequency is what you're, you're wanting, but when you do it, do it, do it well. Um, drip systems are obviously the best way to, to water. It just, you get a more direct uh, delivery of where you want this, the water to go. Um, there's no overspray, there's no evaporation. So that's good. But if you don't have that or you have smaller areas, uh, you can hand water. I think that that's great. Or put like a, a little sprinkler if you can keep track of that. I find those are so hard to get to go exactly where you want them to go, but it's an option. Um, I love these water wands, especially for things in pots. They're really handy to get them going, get the water going exactly where you want. So you're not holding it way high up, you're holding it down close to the base of the plant. You're not necessarily watering the top and letting it fall all down because sometimes it'll actually bounce off the leaves and not even get into the soil. Especially if you have like a big beautiful area that's like the big round floor, uh, floral looking succulents in a, in a pot. Sometimes I even have to like lift up leaves to get my water in, in a pot if something's been in a pot for a long time. So that's something, something to think about. Um, I'm going to go through some, some different ways so that succulents kind of, I, I say, talk to us, little, little signals that they give us. Um, here are examples of rot, which is the absolute worst thing for succulents because it's very hard to recover from rot. Much easier, it's much better to underwater than overwater always. So when in doubt, just don't water. Um, this happens I think this is the most common thing for beginning succulent growers, especially if you're doing succulents inside. A lot of people want to put succulents inside and there's really only a few types that can handle that or can thrive that way um, because of, I mean, mostly because of light, but another thing is air circulation is lower inside. So, so it takes longer for things to dry out. So they tend to rot. So these are signs So like dark, see these dark, dark and mushy as signs of rot. See how the stem is super dark and there's, and it's dropping leaves, that's rotting. This you could potentially save by, I'll go over this in a few slides, but by what's called beheading, you could cut off the top and hope that there's enough um, healthy stem left to propagate this, but uh, I don't know, it'd be risky. So something else to think about is planting. Um, I've seen, I've seen not people not plant things at the right height, and it really affects the health of the plant. So um, there's a lot of verbiage in here, but I'll try to go through it quickly. Um, basically, just be mindful of the depth your succulent was planted in when you received it. So, which again is a guideline, not like a hard and fast rule, because sometimes I get succulents that are potted really poorly where the leaves are buried and that's bad because any leaves that are kind of buried in the soil, those are gonna rot. So the best place is, I'm gonna use my hand as an example. The best place is right at that point between leaf growth and, um, and root, right? So some things have really tall stems and if there's no leaves, a lot of times you can actually get away with kind of burying the stem a little bit shorter if you wanted to, as long as there's no root, uh, leaves in there that are gonna rot. Um, but on the other hand, it's really bad to go too high and you don't want any roots to be exposed. Another risk of planting things too high is that they might flop over. And if things flop over, they're going to break that connection between the stem and their roots. So that's bad too. So you want a nice happy medium. Um, and don't be afraid of, of some roots breaking. Succulents are super hardy. That's why I think they're so great for beginners because a lot of times people are, you know, intimidated by planting things. They're afraid they're going to break it or hurt it. You really can't do that with these guys. I mean, I've, I've done some uh, potted arrangements before that I have so many crammed in and I really, you know, cause I'm creating like a gift or something. So I really want it to look a certain way. And I, I've been known to rip off like 50% of an entire root system, just because I want that sucker to fit in there because it's the perfect one. And it's, it doesn't care. It didn't, it doesn't bat an eye. It's totally healthy and totally fine still. So that's how forgiving these are. So if you're scared or you want to try propagating or, you know, you 
you put something in a place in the ground and it doesn't work, you hate it, you can pull, pull it out, plant it in a different place. Not all plants will tolerate that. I learned that the hard way. I got super into succulents and I've tried moving things around before like, oh, I can do it. Succulents don't care. And then I've killed things before. So um, not all plants are like that, but succulents generally are not going to care. You can abuse them. <laughs> Um, let's see, did I miss anything? I think I covered that. Okay, um, light is another very important thing. So there's common mis misconceptions. I feel like a lot of people think succulents can be in super bright all day sun. Some of them can, um, but most of them as a general rule of thumb would like a little bit of filtered sunlight, especially if you are in hotter areas. So again, I'm in Oakland, I don't get as hot. I could get away with putting a plant in full sun that maybe someone in Sunnyvale cannot because it's a little bit hotter, right? So light is gonna affect how fast things dry, how, um, how much they struggle. So something that's in a lot of sun is gonna be a little bit stressed out and it might, it might be fine, but you're gonna to have to water it more frequently because it's in more sun, right? So, okay, so that's what the light affects. Um, so, and the other thing that's great about giving it a little bit of a break. So as you can see here, this is a picture of my um, nursery in Lafayette. So I have shade cloth over this because otherwise these would just get blasted in all day sun and it would just be too much, especially because I have things in smaller pots. I would have to just water all the time because they would just dry out and be super stressed. So this gives it a nice little gentle break. So it's nice filtered light. Things like trees which I was talking about before, that's a great way to do this. Um, so you don't have to put up shade cloth in your garden. You can use things like shrubs and trees to kind of like just break that light. Also think about the way that the sun moves through your yard at the different times of the year. Because if you had, let's say you have like really harsh bright sun all day, but you have a big rock or a shrub or even like a bigger cactus, you could put a little bit more delicate plant like an Echeveria, those rose beautiful ones, rose shaped, kind of next to it. And as the sun moves, maybe it's only getting a few hours of direct sun. And then at a certain point, it's kind of hiding behind those other plants, right? Or a rock or something that's kind of protecting it, just giving a little bit of a break. So those are all things to think about with light. Um, here's an example of too much light. These are sunburned, see these? ugly sad splotches. So this usually happens um, with transitions. So you're moving it. So this might have been in a sh super shady place or maybe you bought it at a nursery where it was under shade cloth or even indoors or something like that. And then you put it right immediately out into your yard. Bad move, don't do it. Um, it, it needs to transition slowly. So you can kind of like every couple of days get it in more and more sun and that will that will greatly help. Even um, the height of something. So back at my nursery here, so these are like up on tables, right? So a lot of times what I'll do when I buy something that I know has been super babied and in not much light, I'll actually put it on the ground like next to these tables. So it's getting some of that, like I was talking about some of that a break from the sun. So it's not getting as much cause it's not as high, right? So height is a thing to think about. Um, and then I'll slowly kind of put it in more and more sun over the course of the next few days or even week so that this doesn't happen because this will not go away. You will have to wait till these grow out. It's not gonna kill them, it's just ugly, right? So like, see how this beautiful growth is all fine. As this gets bigger, you could pluck off all of these ugly leaves and it's gonna be fine, but just uh, can be pretty depressing. <laughs> I, th I think of them like people, like if, you know, some people with sensitive skin, you are in inside all winter and then you just go to the beach all day long. Like that's probably bad. You wanna like work yourself up to <laughs> being in sun all day. Um, here's an example of how subtle light exposure can change the look of a plant. So this is the same plant. This is with more sun, this is with less sun. So see how beautiful this gets with a little bit more sun. It gets super pink and um, it probably will grow faster and cluster more and have more little pups. That's what these are called as pups or babies. Um, 
and this is still beautiful, but it's just something to think about it. it. It changes them. So this is what I was talking about with stress. So this is stress doesn't have to necessarily be a bad thing. Sometimes uh, plant people refer to stress as a good thing, right? Because you get this beautiful color. They would call it nicely stressed. This is nicely stressed <laughs> versus sunburn, which is bad. Okay, so here's the opposite of that. This is what most people will see when they try to put one of these gorgeous echeverias in their house. It will get stretched out. It is called atoliation, and it's literally reaching for more sun. So it's skinny and stretched out. The leaves are spaced further and further apart. Um, so I was saying only certain certain succulents can stand being inside. Um, oh, I spelled this wrong. This is, this is supposed to be an O. But um, Haworthia, Aloe, Aeonium, Sempervivum, Gasteria, and Sansevieria are all great indoor plants, or at least more tolerant of being indoors. Usually you just don't quite get enough sun for something like this. It really wants bright light. So what this is doing is it's actually increasing its surface area. So it's like reaching up so it can get sun all under all the leaves on the stem. So it's trying to maximize its surface area. Um, and, and on the opposite end of that, if you ever like pay attention to succulents that are kind of out in the world and you'll kind of start to see these patterns and, try, and identify what, what's happening. So I've seen um, aloe that are in too much sun. And so, you know, instead of stretching out and trying to get more sun, they actually curl up and all of their leaves will cup and they'll tighten and it literally is doing this like, ah, too bright, too much sun. It's protecting itself. So if you see an aloe like that, it's usually gonna be like an aloe out in a median or you know some kind of like public area where it's not really well tended to. Um, and then that's usually why. And it'll be like bright red. So that's the cause of that. Um, okay, so this is my favorite part um is the well we already talked about the, all, all the things that the succulents are telling you but um these are the most common pro propagation techniques so there's dividing there's pups and cuttings and beheading and leaf propagation so this is a, a picture of one of my cutting trays and they're all well it's all ready to be propagated so i cut all of these and they're ready to be stuck into soil so I'll show you some of the different ways. So leaf propagation is probably the most, I would say, social media scene propagation technique because they're amazing. I mean, look at these. They all are sprouting new, new heads from just a leaf. So this is amazing. And another thing that's pretty unique to succulents, not all plants will do this. This is the slowest way to propagate. Um, I say do it for fun, not necessarily to like increase your succulents. Um, it takes a very long time to get them going. So this is how, this is one of my leaf trays where I've actually taken the time to stick them in one by one, stick them just a little bit in the soil. And then you're going to water them. Some people miss them like once a day. I, when I do this, usually just lightly sprinkle it with water, like once every four days, um, depending on how attentive I am. Um, and I don't really do this anymore because <laughs> it takes so long. Um, I, when I make my succulent reeds and my wedding bouquets and stuff, I always have tons of leftover little leaves and I'll just throw them onto a, a tray of soil because I don't have time. And then I'm like, whatever makes it, makes it. And whatever doesn't, doesn't. I would say I only have, even when I take the time to do it like this, I usually only have about like a 50% uh, success rate and it takes forever. So I'm not saying don't try it, try it, but just know that it's the slowest way. Um, dividing is a really great and easy way. So things that pup, I have multiple, um, oh, and back to the leaf propagation, not all, not all succulents will propagate that way. A good way to tell is usually if the leaf snaps off easily, that's a good indication that it will propagate that way. Like, and like an aloe leaf, you couldn't do that with. Um, you needed to have like a clean break and this would not have that. 
So anyway, things with multiple branches and stems usually can be divided or like that have multiple pups. See how there's like multiple little heads. So with this, I literally just teased this root ball apart, like untangling hair, pull it apart. And then you have individual little plants and then you just plant them all up. Um, this is another really cool way that some succulents do. Um, this one is a uh, Kalanchoe. I love this one. And see how these have these little little guys on the on the leaflets on the tips of their leaves, and they drop down into the soil. See, that's a little baby right there, and they produce new babies. There's other versions of this that are great. Um, they're great because they spread really well. So you start with one, and then they kind of just propagate themselves, really. And they're great for landscaping or even in a pot, you can harvest the little babies from the pot and pull them out and plant them somewhere else and kind of let them grow. If I do that, I usually wait till they're under the shade of the big mama plant until they're a little bit bigger before I pluck them out. If you wait till things are bigger, especially with the pups too, wait till things are bigger, you'll have a better success rate that they'll grow because they're a more mature established plant before you rip it off. Um, this is called beheading. So that's literally when you chop the head off of a plant. So like I was saying with that plant that was the stem was rotting, you could try beheading it. Um, this one is a partial beheading, <laughs> meaning that there's other plants already growing. This is probably the better way to do it because the plant has all of these leaves and all of this way to, to keep growing and get nutrients versus if you just fully behead it and there's no other leaves, it's a little more risky. You have a little less chance of reproduction, but this is cool because see how this, this is the bare stem that got cut off and this is a new plant growing and another little teeny new plant growing. A lot of times I do this and I'll have new plants growing like a crown all around the stem and it's amazing. So not only does the, the base or the body, I guess you would call it, start growing more, but then you have that head you took off and you can plant that and you have double plants, if not more. Um, I do that a lot when I do wedding bouquets because I'll use just the rosette and I save the pot with this and hope that I'll keep regenerating plants. Um, here's another, another example of, of propagating, which is cuttings. Now this is the absolute easiest way to do it. I, this is my number one way of propagating because you can take a plant like this and just like snip, snip, snip and have all these different cuttings and then plant those separately and you'll still have a nice big healthy plant. Generally when you do this, you don't, if you wanted to propagate out of this, you probably wouldn't want to take more than one third of the plant, of the total plant, just so you're not stressing out the, the main plant too much and taking too much of its, of its energy ability. Like we were talking about before. Um, here's another uh, example of this is my cut one of my cutting trays. So this is made with perlite. I mix perlite into this soil, like I was I was showing in that other slide. Perlite is really great for propagating cuttings because two reasons. Um, one, it helps the soil drain super super fast. It's really great, um, nice and airy which you want for cuttings because they're a little bit more susceptible to rot. And the other main reason is because it keeps the soil light and fluffy. It keeps the soil from compacting and being really tight and dense. And that will allow for those new little teeny tiny roots to shoot out really easily. So it's just going to help it along and make it way easier for that to happen. Um, this is just the way I do it because I'm doing a lot at a time. This is just one of those plastic nursery flats that I put in some old shade cloth to keep the soil from falling out, but still allows it to drain. And I just plug them in there because it's nice and shallow. You could use, you know, if you wanted to experiment, you could use like an old like berry or like vegetable plastic container and poke some holes in it and use that. Basically anything shallow is probably the best way to do it. Um, however, if let's say you're gardening and you break something off and you are lazy like me and you just want to try sticking it in the ground and see what happens, go for it. Um, if you're going to do uh, try doing cuttings, 
the proper way to do it is uh, what's called letting it harden off. So you're gonna wait about 24 hours before you plant your cutting so that that little wound area hardens off and kind of seals itself. Kind of like if you got cut, you get like a little scab built up. That's what you want. It helps protect the plant from soil borne pathogens and from risk of rotting. It's just, uh, it's good practice. Again, I don't always do that because you know, rules and I've had, I've had good luck either way, but that's the, that's the right way. That's the best way if you really want to do it. Um, usually it's about 24 hours. However, if you wanted to behead like a really big Echeveria or an agave, something with like a really big stem, like this big around, which I have totally done before with like a full on uh, bread knife where I'm just like hacking it apart and that you're going to want to wait even longer to plant that because you're going to want that whole surface to harden off. So with those, sometimes you can wait a week, a few weeks, whatever it takes to get that to be nice and hardened off. So you'd be surprised how long those take to harden off, but that's the best way to do that too. Um, let's talk about pests. I hate talking about it because it makes me angry, <laughs> but it's a part of life. They're, they're, they're here. So the most common for succulents are mealybugs, aphids, root aphids, fungus, and scale. Now I've had the most experience with mealybugs and root aphids. So root aphids are gonna look like this. They tend to usually happen more in potted plants than in the ground. However, I know people who have gotten them in their soil before too. Um, I have had good luck with using hydrogen peroxide, believe it or not. So I've taken a big watering can, I put in, I got one of those big brown bottles of hydrogen peroxide and I put in maybe um, like an eighth to a quarter of the bottle and dumped that in the watering can, filled the rest with water and just poured it right into the soil. It's good for the roots actually. And it'll kind of sizzle those little, those little jerks <laughs> and that will help. Um, there's a lot of different ratios. I've tried a bunch of different ones so much so that that's why I'm so casual about the ratio is I just kind of wing it and just dilute it. And I've never, um, I've never hurt anything basically is what I'm saying by putting too much. So another really, really common one is the mealy bug. It's awful. It looks like this close up. It more looks like just little white cotton balls. They usually form at the base of leaf, like where the leaves attach to stems. So there are a lot of times really hard to see um, if your succulent is growing wonky and like deformed, it's probably because of these guys. Cause they're like down in that, that new growth and they'll come out with like kind of curly wacky leaves. So you might want to investigate and kind of peel the leaves apart a little bit. And I spray it with rubbing alcohol. I put a water bottle and I fill it halfway with rubbing alcohol and halfway with water. If you don't dilute it, you could burn the succulents. And the best way to do this too is not in the middle of the day when you're getting bright sun beating down, do it in like the evening or the morning so that you're not gonna risk, the sun might increase your chances of burning the flesh of the leaf. So just be careful with that. Um, I see there are some questions. Are they, should we wait till the end or should we take those, do you think? Sure, we can tackle a couple of them now. Um, a couple of them are related to what you just mentioned. Okay. Um, so you did mention some of that white uh, root rot, um, but someone also said that they have ants in their potted succulent soil. How should we get rid of ants? That's a good question. Um, ants are usually there because of either aphids or mealybug. So they're usually a sign, they're, like ants themselves are not really a problem, but it's what they indicate that's the problem. So look and see if you have aphids. A lot of times aphids will leave behind little sticky uh, sap and that's what those ants are going for. And same with the mealy, they excrete some kind of thing that the ants like. So the ants are bad because they can transfer those bugs to other plants. So I've, I've honestly just used like little ant baits, like the kinds that you stick that aren't gonna like go into your soil or anything like the little, you know, like hubs, I guess to call them. Um, so ant traps are good for trying to manage those and then sort the, get to the root of the problem and, and defeat 
the aphids or the mealybug. For aphids, those I usually will spray with the rubbing alcohol too, but that's almost not enough. You have to use like a really sharp stream of water and just like blast them off. Aphids don't do quite as much damage. They just look gross and then they attract the ants. So that's what's happening there. Good okay. And very interesting. Thank you. Um, that is the only bug related question, okay. um, pest related question. So if you want to keep going, then once you're all finished, we can get to the rest of the questions. Yeah. Okay, great. Yeah. But I think there's only a, a few more. Um, okay. So let's talk about pruning and fertilizing. So this is a very overgrown potted arrangement and, you know, this can happen in your yard in the ground too. So this is something to think about is, um, basically, it, it, think about when you get to a point like this, you could consider re either removing whole plants or just simply cutting things back so that things aren't getting overshadowed shadowed by one another. This one isn't that awful. There's just some dead leaves. Oh, it's always, it's good practice too to, to pull out dead leaves because a lot of times pests and bugs can hang out in there and there's just really, you know, it's ugly. So there's like no point for them to be there. So um, pull out any dead leaves. Dead leaves don't always mean bad. A lot of succulents just naturally shed some old leaves as they grow. The ones on the bottom kind of just will shed. So just pull those out and don't worry that your plant's dying necessarily. Unless there's like a bunch of brown on your new growth, then I then don't really worry about that and pull that away. If you have a lot, like let's say you had like a whole big eschewary like this and half of it was all dead crispy leaves, then I would say it's probably not getting quite enough water. So think, take that into consideration, but some is normal. Anyway, clean that out. Um, I would, you know, trim around maybe some of this out of there so that the Eshveria is showing better. Um, this is more, it's just visually important, but it's actually important for the health of the plant if something is actually getting overshadowed and not getting any light because of another plant is like crawling over the top of it. So that, and you'll see the plant underneath will be like pale and skinny and sad. And so you want to clip that away. But again, be careful because if you clip too much away, that little guy that was buried in the darkness for a month, all of a sudden sun, he could sunburn. So be careful, just always think about that. But yeah, let them breathe, let, let, let things have a chance. So um, that's what I was saying. Just go for it with these because you could just rip them out and you're not going to hurt them and just kind of start over and rearrange and it's great. Um, fertilizer is like a whole world of its own, but I just tend to go as natural as I can. There's these really cute tea fertilizer tea bags called Moo Poo, which I think is hilarious. And they just like have all this nice fertilizer in there and you um, soak them in your watering can and let it dilute, let it like get into the water and then you could just water it right in. Um, I also have used this um, liquid fish emulsion before. Uh, that's really great, really natural. It is a little stinky and it's a little stinky for a couple of days. Um, even the ones that kind of are listed as uh, non-scented can still stink a little. So just be prepared for that. But I just like it because it's just so natural and my succulents have seemed to love it. You dilute this and be careful to dilute it as directed because again, I was a little lazy once. So I'm just telling you all my mistakes. <laughs> and I, um, I think I only had like a little bit left in the bottle or something. So I didn't measure and I just was gung ho and went for it. And I watered poorly also. I watered just like all over the top. So a lot of this super nutrient rich water sat in all of the crevices of my plants and the sun was out and it just fried them. It like burned them because it was too strong and the sun was burning down. So again, something else to think about. Had I maybe done that and then rinsed it all off with more water, it probably would have been okay. But just things to be aware of. Try to really, when you do the fertilizer, really get into the soil and not on the plant. Okay. Just something to think about. Um, and then the other most important thing is to think about the, the ratio of the fertilizer. So a lot of times on fertilizer, like see here, it says, it says two, three, one on here. You want all of that. That's, that's uh, 
referencing the amount of nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium that's in your fertilizer, you want those numbers to all be close. So like 12, 12, 12, 10, 10, 10, 2, 3, 1, that's close enough that it's that it's going to be okay for your succulents. Whoops. Um, so that's that's something to think about. Generally, things in the ground, I don't tend to fertilize that much, but I'm kind of a, a purist, if you will. I don't know. I feel like things in the ground have enough like natural organic matter that they're probably going to be fine. I would more lean towards fertilizing things that are in pots because things in pots, every time you water them, they're losing some of those minerals and nutrients that are in the soil. So you need to replace that maybe once a year. And generally, if you're going to fertilize, only do it um, in the growing season. So like spring and summer, a lot of succulents are dormant during the winter and fall. They're not really growing that much. So it's kind of, it's, it's, there's no point to do it then. Um, and let's see, what else do we have? Oh yeah. So that's like, I'm kind of getting to the end. So here's some other succulent resources that I really like. Um, something that I actually somehow failed to mention is, um, temperatures. So, uh, some succulents are fine with really cold and some are definitely not and will freeze. So that's something to look up with the succulents you're using and find out what your, um, your zone is. So you can look at, um, if you Google USDA plant hardiness zones map, it's a really great way. You can find out exactly what number you are so that when you go to look up things about your plants, and they say, you know, good for this zone, you'll know, hey, that's, that's me, I can do that. Um, or, you know, just simply things that are like, they say that they're hardy down to 20 degrees Fahrenheit, um, and you live somewhere that in the winter it does get below freezing, then you're like, okay, cool, I can, I can use that one. So just definitely check those things. There's, there's ways around it, if you you know really love something and you wanna have it, even though your temperature doesn't really allow for it, you can keep it in a pot and then move it somewhere to, that's a, into a more protected area during the winter, like under an overhang next to your house where it's going to get some warmth from your house. Um, sometimes even something as simple as having a tree over the top of something can keep your nighttime winter temperatures underneath from getting as cold as above it if that makes sense. So it kind of is shielding it. And even if like those few degrees of not getting down to freezing, that could be enough for you to get away with something that's a little more delicate. You can also put like a sheet over it when you know, then there's like a rare night that it's going to get down to freezing things that you're worried about. You can try that too. And it might help protect it a little bit. There's lots of little, um, you know, DIY tricks that people have done. So, um, look into that if you really kind of want to push push the limits. Um, World of Succulents is a great website that I have found for identifying and finding out temperature tolerance. They don't have everything, but um, you can search things by genus. So that's really helpful, especially for me because there's a million species of succulents, but at least if I know the genus, then sometimes I can search that way and find out or um, you know, if I think it's in a certain family, I can, I can look that way. And um, they have lots of pictures and stuff. So that's uh, a good resource that I would recommend using. Um, this is the Ruth Bancroft Nursery that I mentioned earlier. It's basically a one acre succulent and drought tolerant garden that you can do self-guided tours on. They have awesome events. They have a nursery that you can buy plants from. It's fantastic. And a lot of things are blooming now. Um, if you're into succulents and cacti, definitely, definitely go. It's a must. Um, and then this other fun little family owned business in Ripon, California, which is in the valley called Poots Cactus Nursery. Um, that's the family's last name is Poots. And they have some magnificent specimens in their front yard. And the family's super fantastic. And yeah, they just have a lot of really cool stuff. So, oh, whoops. So I would check them out. Um, and then this is me, my little storefront um, on College Avenue. Um, come say hi if you want. Um, I'm always getting new stuff in. And like I said, I'm getting deep into the houseplant world now these days, but I do have some succulents from my nursery as well and cool pots and yeah, like other local 
local artisans and um, yeah, it's great. Or you can always feel free too to uh, email me if you have questions about stuff or follow me on Instagram. Um, yeah, I'm happy to help if you need help identifying something or if you're having problems with something, if I can figure it out, I will do my best. So just let me know. And now I guess we'll go to questions and hopefully I'll be able to answer them. <laughs> Great, thank you so much. A round of applause for you, Jennifer. That was a very beautiful, aesthetically pleasing, entertaining presentation. So thank, oh, you. thank you. All right, so we have a couple questions and folks, um, if you do have any more questions, submit them now so that we can get to them. Um, but I will just start from the top. Um, what type of soil should we use to make a mound and should we amend with fertilizer? And you did go over the types of fertilizer a little bit as well. Mm -hmm. Um, there are a bunch of different soils, but usually if from your like local um, sand and soil places, they'll have bedding mix. So usually their bedding soil is what you want. Um, because like for me, I use potting soil because it's for potting, it has a little bit different makeup. Um, so you can ask them too what they recommend because some places will have like a lot of different choices, but like the mound I did, I just did the the bedding mix and then we mixed in some lava rock here and there where we needed it. Um, honestly, we didn't put a ton of lava rock in that because it was so mounded that I wasn't very worried about things rotting. But when I planted, like I said, like a few cactus, I definitely added more pumice to those holes. Um. You did talk a little bit about that hardiness map um, off the top of your head. Do you have any specific succulents that you would recommend for winter hardiness in our area? Ooh, um, there are a few. Let's see. There a lot of agave are very hardy, and agave I feel like are an underutilized landscape succulent because there's a million different species, and a lot don't get like the giant century plants that you see, there's a lot of dwarf varieties that are beautiful and variegated. Um, let's see, what else is totally, let's see. Um, I'm kind of spoiled because I'm in Oakland. So honestly, I don't think about it too. I don't think about it too often. Um, so none else, no other ones are popping into my head. Keep in mind though, that within different uh, varieties, like within different, so like, let's say like not all agave are, are tolerant down to uh, freezing temperatures. So it's really like a case by case thing. I can't say like all this and all that, but um, oh, Semper Vivum is another one because they naturally grow really high in high altitudes, like in the mountains. So Semper Vivum, C-S-E-M-P-E-R, V I V U M. Well, it's really hard to do without writing it down. <laughs> um, that's a good one. And those are really cute and have a lot of different shapes and sizes. Generally, generally all of those are cold hardy and they're great because they get, they give you that little rosette shape that a lot of times you can't get, um, like with a Shaveri are usually pretty, uh, delicate. So if you want something pretty and rose shaped, that's a good one for that. Perfect. Thank you. Um, next up, I have an indoor, uh, I'm going to pronounce this one wrong, Jennifer. Escheveria, whose Escheveria. leaves, okay, Escheveria, whose leaves flattened out versus pointing more upward. Only the center leaves are more vertical. Is there something wrong? It looks healthy, but looks different than it did when I bought it. Yeah, so if they're flattening out, that sounds like a, a toliation. It sounds like it wants more light. So it's kind of, it's starting to do the, the, the this thing. And um, I bet you, if you have it inside for too much longer, the stem and the leaves might start to stretch out. So I hate to say, maybe enjoy it inside for a little bit longer and then consider moving it outside. Or if you can get it into a sunnier window, do that. Cause that's what that is, right? Like think, like literally think about it, like too much sun, not enough sun. <laughs> uh -huh, totally, totally. i would never thought about it like that, but you're so right. <laughs> All right, next up, what ratio of perlite to soil is best for propagation and growing? Oh yes, sorry, I didn't say that before. Um, it kind of depends on your climate. So if you're in a cooler area and, um, and you're not getting blasted with like super hot days and it's in like 
more shady area, which I do recommend for doing cuttings is like a little bit of protection from the sun. So it's not, again, you're, you're babying them. So you want to like give them a break from the, from blasting sun. But I would like, generally I do 50, 50, but where I'm growing them in Lafayette, it's, it's it gets super hot. So I've been noticing that if I do a little bit less, if I do more like 30% perlite and and 70% potting soil. I, it's a little bit better because I don't have to water quite as often, but I'm still getting that good drainage and um, fluffy soil. Okay, so, so you said 30%. Yeah, like anywhere from like 50% to 30% perlite. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. And then a little follow up on that: what type of soil is best to complement the perlite? Oh yeah, um, any good potting soil. Um, and I know that's like kind of a vague thing to say, but I like soil that has a little bit of sand. It, it, how else to say it, but like it feels good. I don't like soil that has a bunch of like wood chips in it. Uh -huh. um, I'm not a fan of miracle Grow. Um, my favorite place, and I know this is probably super far for you, for you guys, but like I go to American Soil, soil and stone in Richmond, their ultra potting mix is like, like cake to me. Like I, I'm obsessed. With it. <laughs> Love it so much. Like <laughs> I actually have a really funny video of me on my Instagram of me diving into like a six foot pile of oh soil. Oh my gosh! Because I'm so happy that because I got it delivered. <laughs> but it, it's just it's sandy. It has coconut choir. It kind of just like falls out of your hand. Good. It's not splintering you with a bunch of like crappy fillers like wood chips. Like I don't want you know so. I mean, I would say if you really want to do like, good soil and it might be great to just have on hand is like contact your local soil places. And generally I would say that their potting mix is going to be um, better than, you know, just like Home Depot or something. So, pot, but potting soil specifically is what you use, right? Because you want it to have all that nice, um, good, good stuff in it for potting. Absolutely. No wood chips. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay, next up, what should you do with flower spikes after the flowers have died off? Oh, good question. I, yeah, I get this one a lot. Um, it's kind of like any other flowering plant. You just enjoy it for a while it's there. And then when it gets, once it gets dry and crispy, just snip it off. You can't propagate flowers, unfortunately. I've tried. They just don't have the same makeup as the rest of the plant. So even if they shoot some roots out, it's not going to become a healthy big plant. Okay, interesting. I've always wondered that as well. Um, in terms of potting, what materials are best for pots for succulents? Oh, um, that's a great question. The number one is always going to be terracotta. Okay. Um, they, they wick, so they breathe the actual clay itself, you know, the moisture goes through the whole thing. So they dry out quickly and they maintain really nice temperatures. Mm. Um, you usually, I mean, the like succulent experts will say you don't want glazed pottery. Um, you don't want the inside glaze, you don't want the outside glaze because then that takes away that wicking process. However, I have planted succulents in metal like vintage metal pots and I just drilled holes in them and the, and they're fine. So anything is the actual answer. <laughs> you can put them in an old, I've seen people plant in old cowboy boots. Um, that's actually how I started doing all my arrangements. I only did things, I only did arrangements in like upcycled vintage, like strange objects, as long as I could drill a hole in them. Mm -hmm. And even sometimes when I didn't drill a hole in them, I've done things in like crazy bases that there's no way to drill a hole. And it's not, again, it's not best practice, but I put, um, if you're gonna do that, put a layer of charcoal and a layer of rocks and then plant your succulents. And then just be aware when you're watering to not water too much so that you don't have water like sitting at the bottom of the pot and it'll rot. But again, that's a no-no, but I've done it and I've had things in containers like that for years and they look great. So, you know, rules are meant to be broken. <laughs> That's right. Especially with, especially with succulents. Especially with succulents. Oh, another thing I'll just say on that, if you are going to do metal, um, something to take into consideration is the heat. So if you have like, like I really wanted to do, I had this old Weber barbecue, so it's black metal and I potted a bunch of succulents in it and it's great, except for that I have it in full sun. 
those succulents are struggling because that metal pot gets that metal bowl of that thing just gets so freaking hot that it just dries out super fast and it probably was a bad idea or I just need to move it into a shadier spot right so it's not so just metal heats up you might you might fry your plants a little so (laughs) good to know all right, we have two more questions. Um, first one, are there any types that will take full sun or do they all need some shade? Oh, that's a good, that's very good. Um, yeah, I didn't mean to scare you away from that. Um, there are a lot of things that can do full sun. A lot of times if something has a uh, fuzz on it or if it has like a very powdery uh, light blue color, those are like it's sunscreen. So those things tend to do better in full all day sun. Um, again, it kind of depends on where you are, how hot it is, but there's a lot of things that can do that perfectly fine right off the bat. There are also other things that you can, um, you can, they can work their way up to being okay with that, right? Like you, you can kind of teach them to deal with it, especially, like I said, if you have it like a little bit of a break, but, um, you know, cacti, a lot of agave, um, a lot of euphorbias, uh, like sticks on fire. They actually, like, the more sun they're in, the redder they'll get. Um, I'm trying to think of other things. Um, a lot of, let's see. There's some kalanchoe that, that do well with that. Those are what are coming to me. But again, it kind of... It kind of depends. And if you're not sure, um, I find a lot of times it's good to like put like heat things in their pots and kind of move them where you think you're going to plant them in the ground and like see how they do. Now, it's not a perfect way to do it because, you know, things are out in a pot are a lot more delicate than if they're protected in the ground. But you might you might get a little better of an idea of if it can tolerate. But again, just like read about it. That's the best way um, because each one is different. Okay. Good to know. Thank you. All right. Next up, what is the name of the tall plant in the pot at the back of the picture of your store? It reminds me of a slender palm tree. Um, in the back of the picture at the store, which I don't know which maybe, one. I, I think maybe that one down oh, a little oh. bit. In front of the this one? The palm? Yeah, I think so. Oh, okay. My, my little screen was blocking it. So. Oh. <laughs> Um, yeah, that's a palm. Oh my gosh. I'm not going to remember the name of it, but it is a type of palm. It it is a type of palm. It is. Um, if you email me, I can probably like go into the depths of my brain and remember, but it's a palm. (laughs) Yes. Okay. Good to know. We have some good palm spotters in the audience. (laughs) Yeah, that one's amazing. (laughs) It is beautiful. I love that one. (laughs) Okay, last open question. Are there some varieties of succulents that tolerate lower light and can live indoors? You did talk about this a little bit. So what are some of the good ones off the top of your Um, head? Haworthia, which are those little ones that generally have like this kind of white zebra-y striped one. Um, And there's actually a lot of varieties of haworthia. So um, look into that. People often confuse those for aloe because they have a, a similar growth, but there's a lot of excuse me, there's a lot of different kinds and some that are have like, like cool, like kind of clear leaves. Um, Aloes generally do really well inside. Again, you have to have very sunny windows, like some direct sun. Otherwise, it's just not going to be enough. But agave, actually, surprisingly enough, which is so weird to me because they can handle full day sun too. But um, I've been testing out quite a few in my store because I have to kind of cycle in and out the succulents because it's not quite bright enough for them. But the ones that I find that I have to cycle out less frequently are a lot of the agaves. They just, they do well. It's, it's strange. I think it's just because they're so dang like hardy and tough. They're just kind of like, whatever, we'll, we'll take what we can get. <laughs> um, um, also, strangely, I've noticed um, Kalanchoe, the panda plant, the fuzzy one, that one's done pretty well in the sunny window. Um, Aeonium tend to do okay because they kind of like being shadier outside. 
So those I've had for a long time in the store and they seem happy. Um, be careful what you read, honestly, like online. I've I've typed that in before to see what other people say. And a lot of them, I'm like, what? No way. So, <laughs> and I can't think, I can't think of them off the top of my head, but um, yeah, some of them I'm like, that's crazy. So string of pearls actually can be good inside because they're a little more delicate. And so a lot of people do well with those inside, which is awesome because they're so cute. Um, like string of pearls, string of dolphins, a lot of the strings can, can do that. Um, I have found that fish hooks is not so great. And I want to say it's because of that powdery blue, right? So fish hooks are the bigger and they're a more bluish powdery color. And I feel like they get a little bit more atoliated faster than the others. So not that one, but you know, try, try it out. I, I, I hate to say that too, like test things, um, start small, see if it works and then get a big one. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. All right. Perfect. Well, that, um, that wraps up our questions. Okay. So um, we will leave it at that. Everyone, thank you so much for joining us for um, Sunnyvale's last Bosco wor workshop. As I mentioned earlier, there's some more going on in other cities. So check out the Bosco website to learn more. And a big thank you to Jennifer for teaching us all about succulents tonight. Thank you so much for coming and thanks for having me. And like I said, feel free to contact me if anyone has questions and I'll, I'll do my best. Of course we will. Thank you so much, Jennifer, and have Thank a good you. evening, everyone. Yeah, take care, everybody. Have fun, experiment, play. <laughs> <laughs>